If you will, let's all take our Bibles and open to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And we, of course, have been studying through this passage of Scripture, and we've talked about all these uh, characteristics. And now at the end, we're going to go back to the beginning and talk about love. The verse says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we began this series of lessons by talking about uh, the fruit of the Spirit as life, and the idea being that it is, it's fruit, it's a product of life, and it produces life. And the life comes, of course, from the Holy Spirit. And the key to understanding how that life comes to be and exists and grows and multiplies within us is to understand love. So we've gone through each of these characteristics and noted that they are all manifestations of love, demonstrations of love. They're all tied back to and connected back to love. So the fruit of the Spirit is singular, and the singular seems to be emphasizing love, But love is made up of many different aspects. So we've likened it to light shining through a prism. As the light goes in, it looks like it's just white light, but when it comes out, there are all these different colors. Well, it's that way with love. Love is what it is, but it shows itself in so many different ways. And so you have one fruit with these different aspects. But they all are essential to having true love, true Bible love. So I thought it would be good at the end to come back to that idea of love and talk about it just briefly, what it means, and then to relate quickly how these all tie together and end up with the last part of the verse that says, against such there is no law, and talk about the importance of what that means for us. So let's talk about the idea of love. First of all, we know that there are four Greek words that are used for love, translated as love in English, but they're four uh, separate and distinct words in, uh, in the Greek. There's eros, which is the love between a husband and wife, and so it has to do with uh, attraction and those kinds of things. There's storge, a second word used for love, and that's the love that exists between parents and children, uh, sometimes called natural love, a mother who loves her, her newborn child. It's the word that is used sometimes for love of country, patriotism or devotion to another person or to another cause or even to something like a pet and we can understand that kind of love it's it's different from the love between a husband and and wife but it's still an important aspect of love the third word is phileo and that's the word that we think of generally as friendship. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Phileo is the the root of that. And so it means to be a friend or to be fond of someone to have affection for. And I wanted to read just a couple of verses just for the sake of uh, illustration of this word. In John 15 and verse number, uh, let's see, two verses here. Verse 19, first of all, says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And so Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, If you were like the world, then they would love you. They would be your friends. You would be a friend of worldly people if you acted like them and thought like them and talked like them. When we're different from the world as Jesus was... The world does not accept us as friends, and so we're hated by them. And so hated there can mean, you know, just to not love or to not accept, to not be friends with, or it can go even further to the idea that we think of with hating someone. But that's the principle here. If you act worldly, you'll have worldly friends. But we as Christians are not to be seeking those kinds of friendships. We want to be friends with God, and so we have to act like God and be like him. And then John 12, 25, Jesus said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. And so if what we love, if what we're friends with are worldly things, and we love our life in the worldly sense that what's more important to us is getting along with the world, and so saving our life in that aspect, then ultimately we're going to lose to lose our life because we lose our soul. 
But the other side of that verse is that if we um, hate our life, and that doesn't mean we hate ourselves, and it doesn't mean we want to you know, end our lives, but it means if we love God and we love eternity and we love spiritual life and eternal life more than the here and now, then Jesus says that we'll keep it unto life eternal. So we have to decide who we want to be friends with, the world or with God, to be friends with worldly people or Christian people, to be friends with worldly things or with heavenly things. And wherever we give our devotion to determines where we will be eternally, either in heaven or in hell. So that's that kind of love, that love of friendship, which there's an attachment that goes along with it. And we choose, you know, who our friends will be. We can't help the family we're born into. And so we have the storge love for our parents and parents for our children and those things because we have those natural connections, but we do choose our friends. And so we choose who we're going to love as close associates and people that will have influence on our lives. And Jesus is warning us to choose wisely, to put spiritual things first. And then, of course, there's agape. And agape is the word that we often, I guess, usually think about when we think about love in the Bible sense. And there's good reason for that because it's used quite frequently and, and it describes a higher form of love than any of these others. So agape is brotherly love. It means affection or it means goodwill. But it's the idea of loving someone in a social or in a moral sense. And what that means very simply is to love someone so that you seek what is best for them. And so with that kind of love, there can also be phileo, that this person is my friend, and I want what is best for them because we're friends, but we don't have to be friends. Someone can be my total enemy, but I still want what is best for them. I want them to be saved. I want them to go to heaven. And so I still have agape love for them. We can have storge love, love for our family members, love for our children or our parents or uh, other things of that nature, and also agape them, seek what is best for them, or it may be a total stranger to us, someone we've never met, we don't know anything about, yet we still want that person to go to heaven. And so even though I don't know you or your name or anything about you, I'm going to try to set a good example and teach you the way of salvation because I love you. It's a different kind of love, but it's just as important and in that sense, higher. And then it can be our spouse, our husband or wife, where we have romantic love for, but we also have agape love or, again, someone that is not related to us at all. So this is the kind of love we read about in John 15 and verse 13 where Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died on the cross for people he didn't even know. And you understand what I mean when we say that. He didn't know in his life as a human being people he never met. But he's God, so he knows everyone. But that's the principle. Someone who is willing to sacrifice their life in order to protect others that they may never have met or ever would meet in their lives. That's agape love. And that's the kind of love that's described for us in 1 Corinthians 13 in that great passage on love. And we won't take the time to read that now. But I encourage you, if you haven't read it in a while, to go back and to read Paul's description of love there. That's agape, seeking what is best for another. So understanding those, those terms and that idea of what love is, and particularly agape, let's talk just a minute about what love is not from the Bible perspective. First of all, love is not merely a spoken word or words. Over in 1 John 3, in verse number 18, John makes this clear, and as we read this verse, we're, we're going to note what he says, but also the, the, the concept that he's dealing with here, where he says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And when he says, let us not love in word, he doesn't mean that we don't use words that express our love. He means, let us not love in word only or in tongue only. Our love can't be just words. So it's not wrong to speak words of love. In fact, it's a good thing, and we probably need to do more of it in our lives. But it's not enough just to say, I love you. 
John says, and we understand, that love has to show itself in deed, in action, and in truth. And it's key to understand that John adds the word truth there. We say that we love someone, we show that we love someone, but we have to make sure that love is according to truth. Truth is the ultimate standard for love. And that's vital to understand. We live in a world that tells us today love is love, meaning that you can love anyone or anything in any way that you want to, and because it's love, it's okay. That's not Bible love. Bible love is built on a standard of truth. And the standard of truth, of course, is God's law of right and wrong, morality, what is good and what is evil. And so there are some things that we uh, are to love and must love, and there are some things that we cannot love. In fact, the Bible says we have to hate them. We must hate sin, anything that separates from God. So if I have agape love for a person, the thing I want for them more than anything else is for them to be right with God and to go to heaven when they die. So if they are practicing and living in sin, I cannot approve of that sin, those sinful actions, because I love them. And if I compromise on truth because I have feelings for someone or affection toward someone and don't tell them that they're wrong when they are or pretend like their sinfulness is okay, then I am encouraging them to remain separated from God and to be lost for all eternity, and I don't really love them. As much as I, I may say that I do, and whatever feelings of affection I may have, that's not agape love. We sometimes call it tough love, and it's really not tough if we just you know, live by God's standard, but sometimes it's difficult to apply. But that's what true love is. It's not just words, but it's deeds, and it's always built on truth. Secondly, love is not merely an emotion. And again, we see that in 1 Corinthians 13. That passage that describes love is not just about feelings, but it shows us how love acts, how love thinks, how love reasons, how love responds, and how love treats one another. Now, we know that emotions are involved in love. We have feelings that are engaged when we love someone, when we have affection for them, but it's not just feelings. First Peter 3 and verse 8 says, finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And so he's talking about love here and he says love as brethren. And in describing that love, there's having compassion, which starts with a feeling that we are, are we have a, a compassionate feeling towards someone. We want better things for them, but it's not limited just to that feeling. It's expressed in action. So love as brethren, then he says, be pitiful, be courteous. Pitiful means full of pity, and courteous, of course, means to be kind, which we talked about in the fruit of the Spirit. And so when we truly love someone, we'll have emotion toward them, but it will be expressed, again, as we've noted, in action, in deed, and not merely in just uh, a feeling in our hearts. One more verse on this is Romans 12 and verse number 10. Here the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. So we have the affection, but then we demonstrate it in preferring one another, putting others before ourselves. And that's shown in how we live and how we treat each other. So emotions by themselves, that's not love. It's a part of it, but it takes the action that follows from it. Of course, we know that love is not lust. Our world gets those things confused um, so often and mistakes the two. But Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So God says that lust, of course, is, uh, is sinful, but the, the natural desire between a, a man and a woman is to be confined to marriage. It's honorable, marriage is, in all. God has designed that institution of the home and of marriage of husband and wife for that intimate relationship. And so we have to control those desires and channel them and use them in the way that God has told us about in, uh, in his word. And so lust does not equal 
love, again, in spite of what so many think and believe. And then fourthly, love is not a license to sin. And again, we have to remember that because we hear it so often in our world. Well, God loves me, and therefore it doesn't matter what I do. God still loves me, and everything is okay. God loves me, and he wants me to be happy, and so I'm going to determine what makes me happy, and then God will just accept it because he loves me. But that's not the Bible definition of love. In John 14 and verse 15, of course, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Literally, it means if you love me, you will keep my commandments because that's what love does. So true love does not eliminate law, but in fact, true love submits to law, to the law of God. If we truly love Jesus and love him for what he did for us at the cross, for the price that he paid for our sins, for all the wonderful things he provides for us in his body, the church, if we truly love him, we're going to do what he says in order to please him and to honor him. Verse 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So if I want to be loved by the Father, and I want to be loved by Jesus, then I need to do what they tell me to do. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't love everybody. He does. He loves everybody with agape love. He wants everyone to be saved. That's why he sent Jesus, and that's what Jesus, why Jesus died on the cross. But if I want to enter into fellowship with God and become a part of his family and enjoy all spiritual blessings in Christ and go to heaven when I die, I have to be acceptable unto the Father by being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I have to love him enough to obey his commandments. So love is not a license to sin, to just do whatever I want. Love doesn't eliminate the law of God. In fact, it reinforces it. True love actually corrects. When we're wrong, love tells us that we're wrong. Two verses, Proverbs 13 and verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So when your child is wrong, you correct them, right? And if you don't, you don't love them. That's what the Bible says. And people get upset and they say, but I love my kids. I just don't want them to be mad at me or whatever. Well, that's not true love. True love is to teach them and to show them the right way so that they can avoid the mistakes and you know, errors in their lives and they can be right with God. And then there's Hebrews 12 and verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The word chasten means discipline. And so those that the Lord loves, he disciplines. Which means, just like when I got out of line, my parents corrected me. If I get out of line today, God corrects me. And he does that through his word and through the teaching of scripture and all of those things. But he does it not because he hates me, but because he loves me. And so true love corrects. Love is not a license to sin, but rather it enforces the law of God. So when we talk about love, what do we mean? We mean something that is seeking what is best for another, whatever that is. Even if that means I have to sacrifice in order for them to have it, if I have to deny myself, if I have to spend my money, if I have to use my time, whatever it is, I do what I must to help someone have what is best for them. That's what love is, seeking what is best for another. It comes from a benevolent, a compassionate attitude of the person who gives, not from the worthiness of the recipient. And we mess that part up so many times also. We decide who we're going to love based on how they look and how they dress, and the vehicle they drive, and where they live, and where they come from, and all of those things. And we determine some people are not worthy of love, and other people are. But God loves everybody. None of us are worthy of his love. But aren't we thankful that he loved us anyway? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 teaches us. Not because we were perfect and didn't need a Savior and and everything was fine between us and God, but because we were lost and separate and desperately in need, 
God still loved us, and we have to love our neighbor in that way. And so love comes from having benevolence toward others no matter who they are, where they're from, and and all of those things. And finally, true love is an act of the will, and it's under the control of man. We talk about falling in love, and I just can't help it. Well, the Bible says we can't. We have feelings and we have emotions, right? And we call those things love sometimes. Sometimes maybe it is. Other times maybe it's not. But love is, is something that comes from us, from our minds, and we have control over it. So I can choose to not love someone who is leading me astray. Or I can choose to love someone who is my enemy, that I have no reason emotionally to to love them, I can choose to love them anyway because love is an act of the will. We determine whom we will love. So that's just kind of an overview of love and the idea of agape love, especially what it means and and how the Bible uses that term in in some broad terms, but hopefully it gives us a good foundation and reminder of what we're talking about here. Now, real quick, I want us to take that concept of love and bring it back into the fruit of the Spirit. So as we've gone through these different characteristics or attributes, we've been noticing how they all tied back to love. So joy, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Then it says joy. Joy is love's consciousness. And as we studied joy, we came to realize that if I understand God's love for me and I love him in return, then my consciousness is going to be joy. I'm going to think joyfully. I'm going to be focused on joyful things because God loves me and I love him and I'm forgiven of my sins and and in a right relationship with him. And so I have that positive, optimistic focus on life. And the world can't touch that because it doesn't come from worldly things. It comes from God and my fellowship with him. So joy is love's consciousness. Peace is love's confidence. Because I know of God's love for me and I love him in return, I am at peace with him. My sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. I'm walking in the light of his word. And so me and God are at peace with one another. We're not fighting each other. We're not Jacob wrestling with the angel. God's not, you know, fighting us and we're not fighting him, but we're in harmony with each other. And that becomes the, um, the confidence of my life that I have this grounding and this foundation that is firm and sure that I'm at one with God. And that, again, doesn't come from the world, and so the world may fall apart. You know, the psalmist said the mountains can crumble and all those things, but I'm okay because I'm with God and we're at peace. And so peace becomes this demonstration of love, love's confidence. Long-suffering is love's habit. Because I know God loves me and I love him in return, The practice of my life is patience. I suffer long because I know God is in control and I know that he's going to work everything out for my best if I just trust him and endure. So I go through life knowing that sometimes things are going to be difficult and there will be obstacles and bad days and and all of those things. But because of God and his love, I can endure it. And so the habit of my life is long suffering and not just with with the way of the world and things happen but with brothers and sisters in Christ and other relationships and just dealing with people in general all the things that you know get on our nerves we're able to endure those because we have a greater purpose and that is our love for God and then there's goodness goodness is love's quality because I know God's love for me and I love him in return the quality of my life is goodness that I seek to be good, meaning to do what is right, to do what is in harmony with the character of God. So God, of course, is good. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and called him good master, and Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There is one good, that is God. And he was making the point there that the character of God is good. Everything that God does is good and righteous and holy and so if I love him and he loves me then I'm striving to be like him in my thoughts and in my actions and in my words and so goodness becomes the quality of my life and the truth is the only way that I can say I'm a good person 
or I have done a good deed is if I've done it in harmony with God. If I'm outside of Christ, I cannot do a good deed, and I am not a good person. Goodness is tied directly to God through his love. And then there's faith. We talked about faith, and we noted that the word for faith here also is the word for faithfulness, for being faithful, but faith is love's manifestation. And so if I understand God's love for me and I love him in return, then I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to live by faith. My life will be filled with faith. I'll trust God completely. I'll go where he leads me. I'll follow the teaching of his word. Whatever he says to do, that's what I'll do because I trust and obey him. So faithfulness is the manifestation of my love for God. And that's why I do these things. Because I love him. I know how much he loved me, and so I love him in return and show that in faithfulness. Meekness is love's strength. And we talked about meekness, that it's not weakness, but it's strength under control. And so if I know of God's love for me and I love him in return, then I govern myself, or rather allow myself to be governed by him and use my talents and my strengths and my time and my opportunities to serve God, to do his will, to obey his word. And so I have the strength of my convictions. I know that God is right. I know his word is true. And that's where I stand. And I stand there even if no one else does, because I know I'm standing with God. And that makes it a majority, right? So meekness is love's strength. And then temperance is love's victory. And temperance is probably the most difficult of all these characteristics, but it's a natural outgrowth of all the things that have come before, and especially of love. Temperance is self-control. And so if meekness is allowing God to control me, then temperance is that I work to control me also. And temperance is love's victory. And so when I know of God's love for me and I love him in return, the victory that I have is self-control, that I do what God wants me to do, And when I'm tempted to go astray, I look back and I lean upon God's love. And I let that motivate me to make right decisions and to do the right things. And so all of these different attributes and characteristics are different aspects of love. So the fruit of the Spirit is love in its many forms. It's one fruit with all of these different aspects. Now, the last thing we want to notice... It's the end of verse 23, which says, Against such there is no law. When Paul gave us the works of the uh, flesh in the previous verses, as he ended uh, that list of all those sinful things, he says, of course, uh, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And at the end of the list, he included, and such like. So he listed those evil things, and then he said, and anything that is like this. But at the end of the fruit of the Spirit, instead of saying something like that, he tells us that against these attributes, there is no law. If you look back up in verse 14 of this chapter, he says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The whole law of God is summed up in the concept of love. Everything that comes out of God's word, every commandment, every instruction, every statute, every law, always can be traced back to love, either love of God or love of our neighbor. James calls it the royal law. He said in James 2, 8, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And so when we think of the fruit of the spirit as love, And then understand that love is the royal law, it is the summation of the law of God, and it is the greatest command that God ever gave. In Mark 12 and verse 28, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first commandment of all is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
There is none other commandment greater than these. The greatest commandment is love. Love God first, love your neighbor second. But love, what kind of love? The kind of love we've been talking about tonight. Agape love, seeking what is best for another. So it's the summation of God's law, it's the royal law, it's the greatest commands. But not only is it those things, but as Paul tells us here, against such there is no law. Brother McGarvey said this about that statement. He said, all those who do these works of God find no law of God interfering with them in the exercise of their labors. And what that means is that there is no law of God that hinders us in our love for him and for others. Now, that doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want and put the word love on it and it makes it okay. But it means that if we are living according to God's will and loving as he loves, then there's nothing holding us back. There's no law to stop us or to stifle us or to slow us down or to cause us not to love someone. But God always approves of love. True love, genuine love, Bible love, God wants us always to love. And so one who lives according to God's word and produces the fruit of the spirit has no law that can be brought against him. Understand what that means and what is being stated with, with these words. In John 8 and verse 46, Jesus asked this question. He said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? When Jesus asked, which one of you can convict me of sin? Obviously, he knew the answer was no one because he had committed no sin. But how had he lived a life that was sinless? It's because he lived according to the royal law, the fruit of the Spirit. This is the kind of life that he lived. He loved perfectly with joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance, all of those things demonstrated in the life of Jesus, so there was no accusation that could be made against him. We talked about this morning how they did make accusations, but they were false witnesses. No one had anything they could accuse Jesus of, and if I don't want anyone to be able to accuse me of wrongdoing or of sin, all I have to do is live like this. Love the way that God loves and express that love in the way that God has described. Jesus also said in John 14, 30, he said, For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. So even the devil himself, if he came into the world and he stood before Jesus to accuse him, Jesus said he has nothing, nothing that he could say about him because Jesus lived by this royal law. He loved God more than anything else, and he loved his neighbor second. And everything he did in his life was demonstrating that kind of love. He went to the cross because God said to. He loved his Father in heaven enough that he died on the cross because it was the Father's will. And at the same time, he loved you and me enough that he went to the cross and endured all of that for our salvation. Everything he did was out of love for God and love for his neighbor. And because he lived that way, the devil had nothing on him. No one could accuse him of anything, of any sin, because he was living the royal law. Now, a person who lives that way has exactly what Paul was talking about here in Galatians 5 and what Jesus was talking about in John 8, uh, chapter 8. And what that person has is true freedom. Freedom is the context of Galatians 5. It begins with the liberty that we have in Christ, and that liberty is found by living according to this standard of love. Jesus said, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed, in John 8 and verse 36. And in verse 46 is where he says, who convinces me of sin? And so it's that same principle. If we live and love this way, we will be free from sin, not because we're sinless, we're not perfect like Jesus was, but we'll be cleansed from those sins by his blood. And the longer we live that way, the better we'll get at not sinning. 
but we'll be forgiven of our sins and we'll enjoy true freedom in Christ. Remember Genesis 4 and verse 7, Cain and Abel? Cain offered to God a sacrifice that God didn't ask for, didn't command, didn't instruct him to offer. He offered vegetation rather than a blood sacrifice. Do you remember what God said to him? He said, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And that's what Paul is teaching us here. If you will just do this, everything will be okay. You'll be accepted of God. You'll have freedom in Christ. You'll have salvation from sin. You'll have eternal life in heaven because the Holy Spirit will produce this fruit that will manifest itself into the world. You'll be a light to the world. You'll help other people know the way of, of righteousness and salvation, and you'll make it to heaven yourself. That's the principle. If we do what is right, we'll be accepted. But if not, what the Lord said to Cain was, sin lieth at the door. If we choose not to follow the fruit of the Spirit, have the fruit of the Spirit in our life, have it produced by our obedience to the Holy Spirit, then sin's waiting at the door. And all those works of the flesh are right there. And the devil's ready with the temptation. And if we're not focusing on the right thing, we'll yield and we'll end up separated from God and outside of his kingdom and not enjoy true freedom. Instead, we'll be in bondage to Satan through sin and lost for all eternity. The end of that verse at Genesis 4, 7 says, Unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And the idea there is, not necessarily that man would rule over sin, but that sin would rule over man. That if we give in, the devil takes over and he becomes our master. But we want to follow the Lord. And the way to do that is with love. True love, genuine love, Bible love that seeks what is best for others. And most importantly, seeks what is desired by God. And if we'll truly love that way, we'll produce these other attributes and characteristics in our life. And again, God will be pleased, our sins will be forgiven, and heaven will be our eternal home. So as we close tonight, let's remind ourselves that against such there is no law. God doesn't give any law that tells us not to love, but to love in this way. And he'll bless us in doing so and reward us abundantly in heaven. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, you're not following the teaching of the Holy Spirit by listening to the words of Scripture. You're not living in obedience to the gospel and therefore not producing the fruit of the Spirit. Then you need to think seriously about your soul's condition. Make changes so that you can be the kind of person that God wants us to be and follow the example of His only begotten Son. We do that by becoming Christians, first of all. Hearing the good news about Jesus, we believe it and believe in him, that he is God's son and our savior. Trusting him, we then obey his commandments to repent of our wrongs, to confess our faith in Christ, and then to be baptized for the remission of sins. As we come up from that watery grave, his blood has washed away all sins, and we begin walking in the light of his word on our way to an eternal home in heaven. But sometimes along the journey, we stop following the spirit and we start following the flesh and we need to make those things right as christians we can repent of our sins and confess them to our father in heaven or publicly if they needed to be confessed publicly and then pray to god for forgiveness and we have brothers and sisters who pray with us and for us and we know that god hears and answers those prayers and then we can start again living by this standard of love putting god first our neighbor second and knowing that we'll have the assurance of eternal life in heaven. So if there's someone here tonight who needs to do those things, if you need our help or encouragement or prayers, whatever we can do, we'll help you with that. Just let it be known. If you need to respond, come forward and do that, even now as we stand and as we sing.